How to use your kit lens that came with the Sony A6000. Stay tuned. What is good YouTube? It's that one camera guy back at it again with another tutorial for you. This is gonna be a very comprehensive guide that's gonna cover a variety of topics. So please use the uh, links and descriptions below to navigate through this entire video. I highly, highly recommend that you watch this video. You'll find a link up here that pops up. I do recommend you watch the entire tutorial guide that I covered for full manual control on the Sony a6000. Um, it, you should at least try to watch up to the 15 to four, uh, 15 minute mark because I cover how to set up your camera for the shooting that we're gonna be doing in this tutorial guide if you wanna follow along properly. So we are gonna be using the 16 to 50 kit lens that came with it. I'll be going over several scenarios to help you get started. This is a beginner's guide. This is not a video for advanced users because we're covering stuff that, uh, uh, for frankly, you probably already know what to do. But if you're just starting, you have no idea how to use your camera, you just wanna learn how to even take better photos, I'm gonna show you how to do that with this kit lens. So we are gonna cover several different topics. We're gonna be talking about focal length, lens information, prime lenses, aperture, maximum aperture. Um, we're gonna cover a variety of those topics, but I still need you to watch this other video that I'll pop, that I'll, that's over here that goes over some of the basics, the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture. I'm not really gonna be talking about that today, as well as how to set up your camera. If you do not watch these videos, that video, this will not make a whole lot of sense if you're a complete amateur beginner. So please go ahead and watch that now if you haven't done so already. So th again, this is a comprehensive video. We'll be covering different terms. We won't, dig we won't go into too deeply, but my goal is to help you have a better understanding of your camera, of your lenses, and what lenses to get and the, uh, that kind of topic in this one video. So first things first, consider dropping a like on this video right now because it will be a fairly long video so that we can come back to it later. Uh, and if you have any suggestions for future video topics about stuff you should wanna learn how to use, go ahead and post them in the description below. For example, someone said, hey, can you show us how to use the 55 to 210 kit lens? If there's more things like that you'd like to check out, please let me know in the comment section so I can go ahead and start working on those videos for you guys. All right, so, all right, the first topic we're gonna cover is angle of view. So the angle of view has to do with the actual reach of the lens. That's kind of what I'm referring to. I'm not gonna go over all the science and the math behind it, but the point is a lens, every lens will have a given focal length. Some lenses that are zoom lenses will have a variable length, right? They had different focal lengths that they can zoom into. Now, the smaller the number, for example, 16 or 18, it's gonna be a little bit wider than something that is 50 millimeters or 100 millimeters. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example here. So right now I have the Sony 18 to 105 F4 lens here. This is an 18 to 105. Now, the way this lens works is when you are at 18 millimeters, you get a wider view. If you zoom in, you're gonna get 105 millimeters. So what's happening is you're kind of closing in the sides and you're narrowing your field of view. So the more zoomed in you are, the narrower the field of view, and the wider you are, the more you're gonna get. So for example, the lens that I have attached to my camera right now, let me see if I can jump to that right here. So this lens that I have right here is uh, 18 to 10 millimeters. So the focal length is, sorry, 10 millimeters to 18 millimeters. And I know it's out of focus there, but um, that's what I have on that setup. So let me show you. So this is 10 millimeters on the lens. When I zoom in, okay, when I zoom in, take a look what happens. When I zoom in, this is 18 millimeters right there. Notice how it's really, it's really narrowed the view to my face. That's what, that's what the focal length does. So if I zoom back out, Take a look what it does now. There we go. That's 10 millimeters. This is 18 millimeters. Just notice how, for example, at 16 millimeters, you can see my hand here, but when I zoom in, most of my hand's gone. So there you go. That's focal length. Hopefully makes a little bit more sense to you. There are lenses like this one here that I mentioned earlier that goes from 55 to 210. Now, a lens like this would be good for getting photos from far away, maybe some sports, some action because the lens has a longer reach. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. 
uh, I just wanted to cover focal length before we get going on. The next thing we're going to look at is actual lens information. Now your lenses have information on them and that gives you guidance. For example, the focal length, the aperture, uh, the minimum focusing distance, and all of that stuff. There's a lot of things going on. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. So first of all, let's go ahead and take a look at something called a prime lens. This is a prime lens. It's 50 millimeters and it tells us on the actual body of the lens, FE 1.8. So when you see the keyword FE or the letters FE, that stands for full frame. This is a full frame designated E-mount lens. Now, if you see an APS-C lens, which I'll show you later, it will not say the letter F. Here's an example of a full frame camera. This is the Sony A7 Mark II. Now, if I show you the sensor on the camera, you'll notice that it's quite big. Right here, I have the Sony A6500, it's also an A6000 series. And when you compare the two, when you compare the two sensors, you'll notice that the full frame has a much larger sensor. Now, there's some math going on between these two sensors, but just know that having a larger sensor will give you better low light performance, typically, uh, and you'll be able to, you know, create more shallow depth of field, typically with the full frame camera. Now, that's not always true in sense, and you can compensate that with lenses, but usually the case is full frame. Now, this is a completely different type of, uh, you know type of camera to this one, they have two different purposes, but um, that's what I wanted to show you with these uh, bodies. So this is an FE, this is designated by FE, full frame. This is just designated by E, so it's just APS-C. All right, so as I was talking about earlier, there's more information on your lens. If you take a look at the lens from this side over here, take a look, you get additional information. It tells you right here, FE 1.8 to 50, mil, uh, 50 millimeters at FE 1.8. So it's F 1.8, it's a good lens. It's gonna let a lot of light into your camera and you're gonna get some really good photos. The next thing right here, if you take a look, is it says 0.45 meters to 1.48 feet. Now, uh, one uses metric, the other one uses um, US standards of measurement. So what I'm trying to explain here for that minimum focusing distance, what in the world does that mean? What that means is, for example, let me bring my hand up to the camera. There's a certain point at which the camera will not be able to focus. That is my minimum focusing distance. So if you take a look, notice how this lens is able to focus up really close. Even if I brought my eye up to the camera, notice, Notice as I brought my eye closer, the camera was still able to focus. Now, certain cameras and lenses have something called the minimum focusing distance. It's the closest you can get in order to focus on your subject. So for example, you can do this right now. You can do this test so you understand what I mean. What I want you to do is bring your finger and bring it closer to your two eyes. Bring your two eyes to focus on your finger and bring it closer and closer slowly. Now, the point at which you can stop when your eyes are unable to focus Back it up just a little bit. That is your eye's minimum focusing distance. So this is as far as my eyes can focus. Okay, that's how far my eyes can focus. About, I don't know, six, six inches, seven inches from my face is my minimum focusing distance. You might be able to get further if you try really hard, but your eyes get more cross-eyed going that way. So lenses are very similar to our eyes. Our eyes are similar to the lenses. There's a certain minimum distance that we can actually reach. After that, we can't see uh, clearly, it won't be sharp. So just keep that in mind. That's what the minimum focusing distance is all about. All right, here's another lens. This is an 85 millimeter F1.8 from Sony. It is also uh, full frame, but this is what I would call, consider a typical portrait lens for a full frame camera. And let's take a look here. Let's take a look at the information that they're, they're giving us here. So the, take a look. It says FE 1.8 85 millimeters. tells us our minimum focusing distance at feet and in meters. And it also tells us another value here called our filter thread, which is 67 millimeters. I'll talk about filter threads a little bit later. And then also the lens has different switches here and dials. I wouldn't worry about it too much. But this is a full frame lens. It's another example of how to read information on your lens. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is something called a constant aperture zoom lens. A constant aperture zoom lens, what that means is that the aperture doesn't change as you zoom the camera. So to show you a contrast, let me jump to the other camera view right here. So let's take a look here. 
So I have the Sony A6000 right here. And this, <laughs> so you can see I have the A6000 here, has the kit lens. And on the side of it, there's a zoom rocker right here, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and point it to the side over here where Nathan Drake is at. He's gonna be part of our show today. I'm at, let me show you there. You see the 16 millimeters? There we go, we're at 16 millimeters. If you watched the previous video, this should all make sense. If you didn't, shame on you. All right, so take a look. We're at f3.5. That's our aperture value at 3.5. Look what happens when we zoom our lens in. Take a look at the number as it zooms. Did you see the f-stop change? It goes from 5.6, so 3.5 to 5.6. Now that's changing because we have something called a variable aperture zoom, 3.5 to 5.6. At the wide end, meaning the for the smallest the number will go, 16 millimeters at the wide end, it's 3.5. And as you zoom in, 4.0, you keep zooming in a little bit more. At 24 millimeters, started at 4.5. At 35 millimeters, we're at, we're at 5.6 already. So by five points, by 35 millimeters or so, we're already at the the minute the 5.6 aperture value. Now you might be wondering why is this a bad thing and why is this a good thing? Well, take a close look at the photo, uh, at the picture where we're trying to get Nathan over there. Watch. As we zoom in, notice how the picture gets darker. Did you notice that? That is the inherent flaw of, an, of a variable aperture zoom lens. When you zoom in and it gets darker, that is the result of that, uh, of that problem with that type of lens. Now, there's, there's some pros and cons to these types of small lenses like this. One, it's nice, it's portable. We get some range, but the contrast or the downside is that we end up with a variable aperture zoom lens and it's not very fast. So those are some trade-offs uh, that we get with this lens. Now, let's go in and take a look at a constant aperture zoom lens. Okay, so I went ahead and I mounted the Sony 18-105 f4. We talked about this lens already a little bit earlier. If you take a look, it has f4 for constant aperture and 18 to 105 is the focal length, right? Use the keywords, uh, use those vocabulary terms and you'll start to learn your stuff so much faster. So if we take a look again, uh, here is the information on the lens, 72 millimeter filter thread. Actually, I don't even know if I showed this to you. Uh, it tells you right here, I don't think I have then. Right here it tells you E. E stands for APS-C, which is the smaller, uh, the Sony A6000 series of cameras. It tells you uh, four, slash PZ. The PZ is a piezoelectric motor, I believe, that's being used on this lens. Don't let it distract you. It's just letting you know that information. It says 18105G, that's the series of the lens, OSS. OSS stands for optical steady shot. So if we take a look, there's the G. That's the G model series. That's just there for you. And then right here is information about our minimum focusing distance, right there. There we go. So 0.45 meters to uh, 1.48 feet is the minimum focusing distance at 18 millimeters, by the way, not at 105. And then when you look closer, it tells you it goes to 0.95 meters to 3.12 feet. So when you go to the furthest range of 105 millimeters on the focal length, three feet roughly is going to be your minimum focusing distance. Remember, it has the closest that your finger can get to you for you to be able to lock focus on it and get a sharp image. So this is the lens. Let's go ahead and take a look. Let me jump to my other camera here. So if you take a look, my lens, if I rotate the back wheel, right, and the back wheel is right here, These, this stuff is all review from the last video. So if you don't watch it, a lot of this stuff won't make sense. So. All right, so I have the 18-105 attached, and we're gonna go in and take a look where Nathan Drake is at. This lens is F4 constant aperture, so let me rotate the wheel, let me show you. So again, on the back here is the wheel, and you can rotate this to change your aperture. It's all review. Let me go ahead and point it at Nathan Drake over here. So Nathan Drake is right there. Let me zoom out, because it's all the way zoomed in. So there's Nathan Drake. I'm at F4, that's my aperture. If I zoom in, notice how the, the number doesn't change. It doesn't change. I'm at I'm at 105. I'm at 105 there, and I can take a picture if I wanted to. There we go. So that's at 118 to 105. The f4 constant. That's what you get. Notice how it doesn't get brighter or darker necessarily as you zoom in. It might kind of look like that, but really the brightness or the exposure stays the same throughout the entire zoom. So that is the benefit of a constant aperture zoom. Does that 
I, I really hope that's ringing to you now a little bit more. And just understand that lenses like these tend to cost a little bit more because they're constant aperture. Now, not all the time, but in most cases, lenses like these do are a little bit more expensive. So uh, this is a constant aperture zoom. Let me show you some other examples. Here is a slightly more prosumer uh, lens. This is a 70 to 200 f4 constant aperture zoom lens. And let me show you, we can try and find the information here. Take a look. If I can get it exposed properly there. FE, that's full frame, F4, 7200, G Master, uh, G Series, OSS. Let's go ahead and take a look at the front here. Let me get closer. FE4, 7200, G, G Series, optical steady shot. Uh, it tells us our minimum focusing distance from our ranges. And it tells us our filter thread, which is 72 millimeters. By the way, this is the filter thread right here. Sorry, the filter. And this is what I was talking about earlier. I typically use these types of filters for um, more expensive lenses. And that's what I typically do. So, um, yeah, that is an example there. Notice how this lens is a little bit bigger. Let me show you a comparable variable zoom lens. Sorry, variable aperture. So this is your 55 to 210, which probably came with your Sony a6000, or maybe you bought one. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. It is, um, let's take a look here in the front. There we go. It tells us it is E, so it is um, APS-C, 4.5 to 6.3 is the aperture. So it's not very bright. It's gonna, you're gonna lose a lot of light. You're gonna lose a lot of light as it zooms out. And then, if we take a look, 55 to 210 in the focal length, optical steady shot. It tells us our, um, it gives us the value for our minimum focusing distance. And then it tells us a filter thread of 49 millimeters. So if I wanted to go online and buy a filter, I would go and look for a 49 millimeter um, ND, not an ND filter, but just a, a filter for this lens. So you might be wondering, why is this lens smaller than this one? And what some people don't realize is that this one's designed for full frame, this is designed for APS-C. I've been on the field before taking pictures. Someone will have a lens like this. I will have a lens like this. They come up to me and say, hey, that lens looks really big. You can probably see the moon from there or you can really zoom in. And I'm like, no, your lens actually zooms in more because this has a max focal length of 210 millimeters. This only has a max focal length of 200. The only difference between these two lenses is, well, one, a big one actually. This is a full frame lens, but it's also um, has more glass and it has a constant aperture. So that's the reason why these lenses are a bit bigger, heavier, and more expensive. Let me show you one more example. Now this is the 7200 f2.8. This is the G, G Master series camera lens. This is on the professional end of the Sony mirrorless camera system. And if you take a look here, let's take a look at the information, if I can show it to you. It's FE 2.8 7200 GM OSS for optical steady shot. Now the information isn't on the actual lens, uh, it's on the lip here. It tells you the filter thread and the minimum focusing distance of this lens. And the reason why this lens is expensive is because it goes to a maximum aperture of f2.8. It has one stop of light gathering power over the 7200 f4. So I use this lens for high school football games, indoor gyms. When it's really dim, this lens really excels uh, for that kind of work. So that's the reason why you might want to consider a lens like this over this. But then again, um, this is like 250 sometimes, this is $2,600. So there's a big difference in the prices. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is start covering the maximum aperture and the minimum aperture information that I talk about. The reason why I'm going over this is so that you understand the language that I'm using to communicate with you if you're just a beginner. Um, but here we go, this is a manual lens and a manual aperture lens. It's a Makey 35 millimeter f1.7. If you wanna see a guide on how to use manual focus lenses, and by the way, it's super easy, let me know in the comments below and I can teach you how to use this lens. It's only a hundred, it's less than a hundred US dollars. And I'm gonna tell you right now, my first impressions, it's amazing. Um, you get really good quality for the price. So here we go, let's take a look. This is a manual focus lens. Um, let's see the information here, guys. See, the thing is you guys are already so smart. So take a look. You already know the maximum aperture, 1.7. 35 millimeters. Look at the filter thread, 49 millimeter filter thread. And then there, you know what this is, I'm not gonna tell you, because you already know. So all that information's on this lens. Um, 
But what's interesting though, it's one foot. So a, about a distance of what, like, like that maybe? That's how close I can get to my subject. But what's really cool about this lens is that I'm gonna use it to demonstrate to you what maximum aperture and what's going on with your aperture value. So if you take a close look here, this bottom part of the ring is our aperture ring, okay? And then the top part is our focus ring, that top piece right here. Now, when I go to f1.7 right here, where it says 1.7, that is called my maximum aperture. You're like, what? Shouldn't the bigger number be the maximum aperture? No, it's actually the opposite. Now, the reason why it's called the maximum aperture is because when you're at the maximum value, the lens opens up, the maximum opening the lens will have. So inside of the lens, let me show you here. All right, so here it is. Uh, so let me show you the diaphragm blades on here. So these are diaphragm blades. Now, I'm gonna, set, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna go to F4 on this lens, okay? So I'm on F4, I, I, move, I move this ring. See where the, dim the diamond's at? That's F4, let me show you where this is. is. Take a look. You see that little diamond right there? Sorry, the, the diaphragm blades, that's F4. Now, when I go to F2.2, F2, when I go ahead and move this down to F2, take a look, I'm gonna move it to F2 right there. So now I'm at F2, take a look now. Notice how it's even open more. And then when I go to when I go to 1.7, it opens up more. So when we refer to maximum aperture, when you make the number smaller, the opening gets bigger. That's why we're talking max aperture. When we increase the aperture number, so take a look, when we increase this number, so, sorry about that, there we go. Let me move this to 22, so now we're at f22, now look at the lens. You see the opening, it's got it even smaller. All of the stuff that we're doing here, you see how we're moving this, we see how we're moving this ring here, and you see how we're moving this ring here? All of this stuff is going on inside of this lens right here. This is a autofocus lens, right? This lens has everything automatic. Aperture changes electronically, and also the manual focus, um, is also done electronically. The focusing is done electronically. All of that stuff's happening. Take a look inside, do you see it? You see that little aperture blade there, the, the blades? They're in the lens too. It's just that I can't change it because I don't have physical control over the aperture. So that's what's going on when I say minimum aperture, I mean F22, something like a big number. When I say maximum aperture, I'm talking about the, uh, how big the opening gets. And also, let me explain to you, when you set your aperture to 1.7, you're letting more light into your camera. So if you take a look right here, I'm at 1.7 right now. At 1.7, I'm actually letting more light in. And you, and you might think, why? Well, take a look. When you're at 1.7, the opening is much bigger, but when you're at f22, the opening gets smaller. So as you increase the number, the picture gets darker because the diaphragm is shrinking, but when you want more light, you open up the aperture, right? Opening up the aperture, you're gonna get more light into your camera. So let me see if I can demonstrate this really quick. So I have the manual focus lens attached. I am going to jump to my other camera mode here. All right. So you see how it says F dash dash? It doesn't, it doesn't watch it anymore. We can't see it. So I'm at F1.7 right now on the actual camera lens. So take a look. I'm at 1.7. I'm at 1.7. I'll just, I'll just focus on the wall so you can see it on the ceiling at 1.7. But as I increase the number, look, it's getting darker as I increase it. So at F22, it gets really dark. But as I open it up, it gets brighter. And I don't think we can catch it. I don't think, there we go, we can actually see it. So take a look, it's a great explanation. See, there's F22, look as I get to F, F1.7, as I open it up, when you open up the aperture, it gets brighter. So when I'm opening it up, it means I want the number smaller, okay? So hopefully you can see that, and you have a better understanding of how aperture works. Now, that was probably more information that you needed. If you got 50% of what I explained, good job. Rewatch the content, go online, look up from some articles to learn more. So now we're on the section talking about um, the steps when you're gonna take a photograph. So if you can remember these four simple steps, well, there's a little more complicated, I'm just simplifying it, then you'll be halfway there. Number one, determine the correct focal length when taking a photograph. Number two, determine the proper aperture. How much do you want in focus? How much do you not want in focus? Number three, what is an appropriate shutter speed? Are they running and moving? Or are they not moving? Or do you want some motion blur? And four, what should your proper ISO be? If you tackle it in this order, focal length, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, 
and you're using manual exposure, you're gonna get it right every single time. It's not really complicated. It's just a process that you do. Now there's other quirks uh, as far as setting the proper autofocusing system, drive mode and all that stuff, but in general, focal length, aperture, shutter speed, ISO is the way you should go. So let's go ahead and take a look here. Um, I've got Nathan Drake here, he's our model again. And uh, we're gonna be talking about focal length right now as what's an appropriate focal length. So I'm gonna go ahead and adjust the zoom on my lens. So we're at 16 millimeters right there. It's a little overexposed, let me drop, drop down the ISO. So we're at 16 millimeters there. And you're wondering when should you use a 16 millimeter? So between 16 and 24 millimeters, in my opinion, with an APS-C lens, you can probably do group pictures with it. So 16 millimeters, 24 millimeters is kind of the range that I would stick with uh, for a group photograph. So if I had like a lot of different little, uh, had other people in the shot and everything like that, that's where I would be at for 16 to 24. And obviously you can get creative too, but remember we said, I think it was about, the lens says it's about one foot. So at 16 millimeters, let me go to one, 16 millimeters. I can only get up to Nathan Drake about one foot before it breaks on me. So I'm gonna hold my shutter button halfway as I'm getting closer. Notice how there's a green box there on the lock on AF. As long as it's green, it means it's gonna be able to be in focus. I think probably right around there is where it feels most comfortable. So there you go. So that's as close as we can get at 16 millimeters. So if we wanted to get a little bit closer, then we would zoom in more. We would have to zoom in with our lens. Now, my recommendation is when you're doing a portrait of a person to use about 50 millimeters on the actual lens. So if you know you're gonna be doing a portrait of a person, go to 50 millimeters, okay? If you're gonna be doing a group picture, maybe four or five, maybe more people, and you don't have a lot of space to back up, then go to 16 or 24 millimeters between that range. So let's go ahead and take a look. So here we are again, and let's see here. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in to so I'm gonna zoom in, let's zoom into 50. Notice how much closer we are, but we also notice it got darker. We'll go over the settings in a little bit here, so don't worry about it. So let's take a look here. So now we're framed, I'm gonna go ahead and recompose a little bit. Take a photograph, play it back. So there you go. Even at 50 millimeters at with this kit lens, by the way, I'm, I'm telling you right now, even with the kit lens, I was still able to get some shallow depth of field. But mind you, it's because we're really close to our subject and the fact that we're dealing with little figurines, it's doing that for us. But if we were using an actual human being, the, the difference would be much different. You wouldn't get the same kind of shallow depth of field that we're getting in this range, but you still could. You just have to shoot at 50 millimeters. Finally, the other focal range that I wanna talk about is between uh, 35 millimeters now, 35 millimeters on a lens like this, or 24, 24 to 35 is kind of like the normal kind of range, um, similar to what your eyes might see. So 24 to 35 is a range that you would just use for general photos, in my opinion. Now, you can always break the rule. There's no one standard rule for everything, but let's say I'm at 30 millimeters. I'll compromise, I'll be in between, so let's say like 29 and that's my, my standard range. I can definitely use that to go ahead and take some photographs, position, recompose, and even take a photograph of Nathan there. And let's take a look, let's go to full mode. And so we got, we still got a good shot. It still looks pretty good. Framing's a little bit different on this one. This one's a little closer, this one's not so much. But there you go. That is the my recommendation for focal length and what you should do with it. All right, so. Now we're on to the portion that you're very interested in. It's called our scenario section. So the first thing we're gonna do is photograph a person in a room like this, not a lot of lighting, with this camera, the Sony a6000 with the kit lens. We need to determine what our shutter speed, our aperture, our ISO should be, as well as our focal length. That's a new key factor with this, this, uh, this lens setup. So let's go ahead and jump into the mode here. So we've got Nathan, we gotta take his picture, and my goal is I wanna do a type of photograph where there is some shallow depth of field, some rule of thirds, as best as I can. So since as a person, I'm gonna go ahead and think in my brain, I'm gonna zoom in to 50 millimeters. That's kind of my focal length for portraits. So I'm gonna go to 50 millimeters. 
So at 50 millimeters, now my next question is, what should my aperture be? Well, because I'm doing a portrait, I'm gonna use the smallest aperture value my lens will go to. Now, unfortunately, on my camera, f5.6 is the lowest number that it will go to. That's as much as I can do. The next thing we're gonna calculate is our shutter speed. Now, our shutter speed is determined based on our subject. So if our subject's running around or moving, we need a faster shutter speed. But Nathan's gonna be nice to us, he's not gonna run around. So we're gonna go ahead and stick with a slow shutter speed of 50, of one over 50. Now the general rule of thumb is, whatever your lens's focal length is, you do one over that range. So for example, this is a 50 millimeter prime lens, I will shoot minimum one over 50. Now let me jump to the example again. Let's say, before we continue on, let's say I zoomed out to six, um, let's say 24, let's say we were at one, at 24, 25 millimeters or so, what should our shutter speed be? Well, my shutter speed should be one over 25, at least. Now because the lens is on a tripod, let's assume it's not, but it has optical steady shot, I can probably shoot at 125 if the subject is not moving. Now if the subject is running around, then we definitely cannot use that if we're gonna, if, unless, if we want a sharp image. So just keep that in mind, uh, cause we're, we're, the problem that we have right now is that we don't have enough light. So that's our challenge. Let's jump back to 50 millimeters. Let's go ahead and rotate the back wheel. Let's jump to 5.6. And now we have our settings here. The last thing we gotta do is change our ISO. I am think I'm just gonna bump up my ISO by one click. My exposure, you see where it says plus or minus on the actual, um, Right here, it says zero. It looks like it's okay now. The, the camera thinks it's okay. And let's go ahead and try and get a focus on Nathan there. There we go. Recompose, looks okay to me. Take a photograph, and that's it. There's our shot of Nathan, and that's our picture. That was it. That was super simple. Not complicated at all. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and do a situation where maybe there is uh, a group picture. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump to that right now. All right, so we have kinda got an odd setup here. Take a look. Let's say we're in a really s tight room, there's not a lot of space, and we have to do a group picture, okay? We have to do a group picture, but we want more of their body in the photograph. So we're definitely gonna have to zoom out, right? So again, figure out our focal length. So let's try, I said 16 to 24, I think. So let me go to 24. That's kind of my safe range there. Let's go to 24. And now we can see our subjects, right? Let's see if um, the next step is, since it's kind of like a group picture still, we're gonna go ahead and keep our aperture at 5.6 to play it safe. Um, we haven't talked about it, but zooming out will also affect your depth of field, but we're not on that subject matter. Let me say I kind of messed up my settings here real quick just to make things more interesting. So first of all, we set our focal length. The next thing we're gonna do is set our aperture. We can actually drop our aperture to 4.5. I'm gonna leave it at 5.6 to play it safe to make sure they're all in focus. And then I'm gonna go ahead and set my shutter speed because they're not moving to 1 50th of a sec. Well, I'm shooting at 124 right, at 24 millimeters, so I'm gonna go to 130th, or actually 125th, they're not gonna move, and I'm gonna go ahead and crank up my ISO until it looks okay to me, that looks, this looks okay to me, I'm gonna go ahead and, pre I'm gonna focus on link, because link is the one more towards the front, hold the shutter button halfway, and then take a picture. Now I can frame this a little bit better, I can move in a little closer and take the photo. Let's go ahead and take a look at our images. Okay, so there's our group picture, and there's our other group picture um, of Nathan and Link. And that's it, that is a group picture. And you might be wondering, what would I do if I had multiple rows of people? Well, it's the same idea. So if you had multiple rows of people, so let's say for example, Link was back here, okay? Say Link was back here, and we were doing a group shot. Now, see how they're kind of far away. We're gonna go ahead and zoom in. Zoom in to like 50 millimeters here or something. There we go. So we're zoomed in. And now, our goal is, maybe we just, we don't need their whole body. 
we need to figure out the proper settings. So our settings haven't really changed that much. So let me just go and mess up my settings a little bit here to fix it in, in this scenario. So again, our focal lengths can have already been set. Our aperture, we're gonna start at 5.6 to let on the light in and to get enough depth of field. Shutter speed to play it safe, we're gonna to go to 1 50th of a second because we're kind of zoomed in. And ISO, I'm gonna tweak a little bit here. Let's go ahead and frame it. Focus on Nathan because he's in the front and then go ahead and take a picture of our group. Okay, now let's go to full capture. So we have our photograph. We notice now link is out of focus. Uh, we didn't get enough depth of field. So what we need to do is go ahead and increase our aperture. So that's that's our problem. Now we gotta fix it. So let's go back to the drawing board. Let's increase our aperture to F11 to get enough in focus. And then we're gonna go and crank up our ISO. And then we're gonna go ahead and take the same photo again. There we go. All right, so they are both in focus, but look at the compromise we've had to make. Both um, ISO is really high, the photo is really grainy, it doesn't look as pleasing, but we accomplished getting both people in focus. So uh, what I would do if you were in this situation that there was two people, I would ask them to get closer to each other. So if, if that was you in the same situation as me, I would say, could you just get a little bit closer to each other here, okay? That way you would get them on the same focal plane and you wouldn't have to use F11 because F11 you're going to lose a lot of light. So that's how I would approach that situation. Now there's more ways to get a better photograph and when I haven't talked about it and it won't be covered in this particular tutorial, we can actually use the flash on our camera and improve the quality of the photograph with our kit lens. Now that's going to be reserved for a separate video, but if you'd like to see it, give the video a like and leave a comment in the description below if you want to see me using flash on the Sony A6000 on how to get some better photos indoors. Okay, so today outside, I'm going to go ahead and show you the steps I would take in taking a portrait photo with the kit lens. Now the kit lens is not a wide aperture or a large aperture lens. In other words, we're not going to be able to blur the background very easily. So right now I got Nathan Drake, he's in the shade. And what I want to do is uh, get some shallow depth of field. So first thing we need to do is set up our settings to the proper settings. Um, what we need to figure out is when we're outside, we want to set our ISO to 100, which it kind of already is. I had it set there already. And then from there, we need to determine our focal length. So on our lens, I'm going to go ahead and zoom it in. I apologize for the noise in the background. I'm going to zoom in my lens. Now, typically 50 millimeters is our portrait range. So now I've, I've zoomed into the photograph. I'm going to go ahead and press my shutter button halfway. And, it, it, you know, Nathan, t technically the camera thinks it's exposed properly, but it looks a little dark in the photograph. So uh, my aperture right now is set to the correct setting. It's the lowest it'll go because I want as much, I want to get as much shallow depth of field as I can. And then finally, uh, to make the picture brighter, we can just drop our shutter speed. Okay. So there we go, that looks good. And again, even though it's telling me plus seven or something, I'm going based on what my eyes are seeing. And let's go ahead and press it and take a photograph. There we go, let's play it back. And there's our photo of Nathan. Now I'm gonna go ahead and move it from the tripod now. Here we go. All right, so here it is. Let's do this again. Let's frame it up a little bit better. Again, I'm at 50 millimeters right now. Hold the shutter button halfway, take a photo. And there you go, there's the photo with Nathan Drake. Really simple to do. Now if you take a look, um, my background is very overexposed. You notice that background right there is really bright. So Nathan's in the shade, so it'd be a good idea to keep his background in the shade as well. So let's go ahead and set that up right now. All right, so if we take a look at this photo, this area here is in the shade just like he is. And so we'll do a much better job here. So I'm going to go ahead and set my focus point on Nathan and then move with the rule of thirds if I can. See how much it'll stay in focus. And then take a picture. There we go. Now let's take a look. The exposure looks a lot better compared to here where the background was blown out or overexposed. This one looks a little bit more balanced, which looks a lot better. Um, let me just go ahead and move the camera closer. I'm a little bit closer now so we can get more shallower depth of field. There we go. And that looks pretty good too. Okay. All right, now that what we've done is we've moved Nathan into the sunlight. So now he's in direct sunlight. 
and it's a little bit bright. So what I need to do is go ahead and adjust my settings to make it appropriate. So again, our ISO should be 100 out in the daytime when it's really bright. We're doing a portrait photo, so I wanna make sure I zoom in. Right now, I'm just showing you what my brain is thinking right now. And finally, it looks like it's overexposed to my eye. I wanna press the shutter button halfway, and then I'm gonna start increasing my shutter speed until it looks appropriate. There we go. And then I'm gonna increase just a tad more and then take a photograph. So that looks good, let's play it back. There it is. And then let's get closer up too. And there you go. That's it. That's pretty simple to do. Not complicated at all. Um, something I do want to mention is that your background is really important. Uh, so for example, if I took this picture of Nathan and the background was just this wall right here, because we're really close to the wall when we take the photograph, it doesn't look as interesting or appealing uh, in the image, but if you move the background further away, if the background's further away from you, the picture will have a lot more interest than it being closer. So it's really important that you think about your background, that you move your subject um, to get a to get a nicer photo. All right, this next example that we're going to do um, has to do with motion. So let's say we're back with our fidget spinner again. It was really important that you watch the very first video I put together. Uh, that I recommend. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can, I can get this in the frame, but I'm going to go ahead and move my focus a little bit here. So let's say again we have a moving subject and this time we're outdoors and I'm using the kit lens. Again, the same principle applies. If you got to go wide, shoot wide. If you got to zoom in, zoom in. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. If you want shallow depth of field, then zoom in to 50 and then keep your aperture at a lower number and take a look. See, look at this. I can get a much shallower depth of field in my photo. So we take a look there. And we need to get an appropriate shutter speed. So remember I said a, a shutter speed of like a one one thousandth of a second is appropriate for freezing action. Um, so, so again, here's our fidget spinner. Let's go ahead and, and increase our shutter speed. Our ISO is already where it should be at, initially 100. Our aperture will not go any lower. And then our, IS, our shutter speed, we need to bring it up to 1,000. But when we bring up our shutter speed to 1,000, notice what happens. It gets darker. The photo gets a bit darker. So we need to compensate this. And the only setting we can compensate for is ISO. So we're going to increase our ISO a little bit more. And then finally, we have a somewhat decent exposure. So what I'm going to do is just kind of frame it here. I'm going to spin it. And then take a picture. There you go. Let's take a look. And there we go. The fidget spinner looks a little blurry. We might have to even do two thousandths shutter speed. Let's go to two thousand. And then uh, compensate the ISO, increase it. There we go. Uh, there we go. Spin it. Let's play it back. And there you go. Uh, fidget spinner looks pretty solid. Looks like it's frozen in time. Now, if you remember, there was an example that we did where I wanted the fidget spinner to have like a motion motion blur in a photo. And to get motion blur, we have to use a slow shutter speed. Uh, to do a slow shutter speed outdoors might be a little bit tricky, but let's go ahead and see if we can do it. We're going to have to uh, drop our shutter speed down to like 1 1 25th of, 1 25th of a second or so. I think that's, that's enough. Um, but what we're going to notice is our exposure is going to be really bright. Let me drop down my ISO. I'm just kind of teaching you what's going through my brain. And then finally, uh, unfortunately, it's still too bright. The only setting that I can change is my aperture. So I'm gonna increase my aperture, which is it's pretty big. I had to change my aperture. Okay, now my aperture is like at f25, which is pretty insane. Okay, now I wanna focus on the fidget spinner here. There we go, spin it. There we go, let's take a look. And, uh, ooh, we got some crazy stuff going on. Um, I don't quite see all of it. Well, there you go, guys. You made it to the end of the tutorial. Congratulations. Now, again, if you got 50% of what I covered today, you're going to be on your way to being very successful at this stuff. I'm dead serious. What I want you to do now is do exactly the same things I was doing. Find something in your house to take pictures of, a little figurine. Go outside, look at some flowers, take some pictures of stuff out there. Using the thought process that we already covered. One, start with your focal length or maybe ISO, depending on your environment. So you're gonna look at focal length, shutter speed, aperture, ISO. 
Think about all those settings, and if you can keep that in the back of your mind, you're gonna be very successful at what you do. Now, if you got a lot of value out of this video, please consider giving it a like, sharing with a friend, leaving a comment in the comment section below. I'd really appreciate it. And if you really wanna help me out, consider using the affiliate links that I have posted in my description. You can click on it and it goes shopping on Amazon somewhere and I get a little kickback. And if you even wanna be bigger help, you can consider making a small donation through our PayPal in the description as well. Now, if you wanna see any more videos, tutorials, and guides on how to do something, let me know in the comments section below. I need some ideas for content to make, and hey, you know, if you suggest ideas, I'll go ahead and work on making some videos for it. And other than that, uh, subscribe if you haven't done so, check another video out on the screen if you haven't had a chance to, and with that said, I'm your host, That One Camera Guy, and I'll catch you on the next video. Bye.